I previously touted hematopoietic stem cell transplant as perhaps the most effective disease-modifying therapy in MS in analyzing different head-to-head -head trials, but did I overhype it? A recent international study suggests it may not be much more effective than other high-efficacy disease-modifying therapies. We'll take a look at this study in detail. And remember the Chinese proverb, take a second look, it costs you nothing. Here you can see the authors of this presentation, which was given at Ectrams, a European MS conference in 2022, which I did not personally attend, and I don't know the authors very well. One thing to note is financial conflicts of interest. Numerous authors on this paper have received various forms of compensation for different activities from pharmaceutical companies which market MS therapies, including the ones that I'm going to discuss, although many other authors of this paper did not receive such compensation. I personally have no specific conflict of interest, though certainly my training and experience is more in traditional MSDMTs rather than an HSCT, though I've had patients have that treatment as well. I won't get into the nuts and bolts of HSCT in this video, but I have an excellent playlist on this topic if you want to check it out in the description below. Briefly, hematopoietic stem cell transplant for MS is not a stem cell therapy per se, Rather, the conditioning regimen involves chemotherapy drugs which wipe out the immune system, and hematopoietic stem cells help to reboot the immune system. Sometimes this could lead to improvement and even long-term remission, though it does come with side effects. Although people think of it as a single treatment, really it's a group of treatments with different conditioning regimens that have different efficacy and side effect profiles. Also, you can check out my book, Resilience in the Face of multiple sclerosis, the protagonist of chapter four underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplant by Dr. Richard Burt at Northwestern, same doctor who performed the procedure on Selma Blair. The book is completely free on Amazon. So in this study, they only looked at people with relapsing or emitting MS, can't say anything about progressive MS, and they used six autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant MS centers in Ottawa, Uppsala, Sheffield, Bergen, Sydney, and Melbourne, and they did a comparison to data from MS Base, which is a well-known MS registry. So this is not a randomized controlled trial, and they use something called propensity matching to try to get rid of some of the confounding. The inclusion criteria required you were treated with one of four treatments, either HSCT, any conditioning regimen, Gelenia, which is a once-a-day pill for MS thought to be moderate in efficacy, or Ocrevus or Tysabri, two infusions thought to be high efficacy disease modifying therapy. And you had to have sufficient information recorded prior to and after the start of therapy so they would have meaningful data and a clear baseline so they could do propensity matching. They tried to match the patients based on their sex, age, EDSS, or current level of disability, expanded disability status scale. This is a measure of disability used in MS research. Also, the number of relapses 12 and 24 months prior to baseline, in other words, prior to starting the current drug, and time from MS onset, in other words, duration of the disease, and the most effective prior therapy, and the country where they were receiving the treatment. Is this as good as a randomized control trial? Of course not. There are biases in who seeks out what treatments, but this is the best they could do with this methodology. As a group, the people in the study had relatively active MS. Let's look at their baseline characteristics. On average, they had 0.9 relapses in the prior year, which is a lot. If you look at the placebo group in a lot of modern clinical trials, you see numbers like 0.4 annualized relapse rate or relapses per year. This is something we would see in older studies like the initial beta seron trials. Their mean EDSS was 3.7, which is moderate disability on average they were walking independently without a cane and could walk decent distances but had some degree of disability and you can see the number of people who received different treatments hsct 144 gelenia 769 ocrevus 343 and tysabri 606 and so they're comparing the mean of each group against hsct and again they use propensity matching so it's not everyone taking gelenia versus everyone who received hsct they tried to match the groups in their baseline characteristics to make it as fair as possible. 
So let's get to the data and we'll start with HSCT versus Jelenia, the once a day pill, which is better? We'll start by looking at relapses and what they measured is ARR or annualized relapse rate, number of relapses per person per year. And for Jelenia, it was 0.2. In other words, on average, one relapse per five years. Remember, at baseline, they had 0.9 relapses per year, so a pretty significant reduction. But for HSCT, it was almost half that at only 0.11, about one relapse per nine years. And you can see there is a pretty significant standard error, but HSCT was better and it was statistically significant. The hazard ratio was 0.55, in other words, 45% fewer relapses. And you can see the 95% confidence interval does not intersect one, meaning it was statistically significant. What about disability progression, worsening of the EDSS? Now, they don't say in the poster or any of the articles that I could find, whether they looked at three-month disability progression or six-month disability progression. So we'll have to wait for the full publication, I guess. But again, HSCT looks good. And they had a hazard ratio of 0.49. In other words, 51% less likely to have disability progression. However, it was not statistically significant. You can see the confidence interval is massive. 0.16 to 1.54, it intersects one, it's not statistically significant. What does that mean? Why would that occur? Well, it just means even with this relatively large sample size, there just weren't that many people on either of these treatments that were progressing. They have relapsing MS, they were both on a good, pretty good therapy, and there just weren't that many people taking Jelenia who were progressing, and it's a relatively short study with a mean follow-up of around three to five years, depending on the specific group, so it's really difficult to show a difference. So it wasn't so clear here, but there's a trend towards HSCT being better. What about improvement? Here, HSCT was clearly better with a higher chance of disability improvement, a hazard ratio of 2.6, so more than two and a half times more likely to improve with HSCT. And this was statistically significant. You can see a confidence interval does not interlap one, it goes from 1.46 to 4.72. So you can see on all three measures, certainly HSCT looks good, but Jeleni is only a moderately effective treatment. What about the high efficacy infusible medications? Perhaps Ocrevus can answer the call. The infusible B cell depleter, very popular medication. We'll take a look at the relapse rate. The Ocrevus annualized relapse rate was only 0.1, so a almost tenfold reduction in relapses compared to baseline, one relapse every 10 years. It was slightly better with HSCT, 0.08, but not a statistically significant difference and really not a clinically significant difference. We're talking about a one relapse in 50 years difference. That really is insignificant. The astute viewer may say, well, why is this different than what you showed me on the prior scan slide? I thought it was an annualized relapse rate of 0.11. Well, because of the propensity matching, they use different people with HSCT in order to match them to the people receiving Ocrevus. So no real difference in relapses there. But what about disability progression? Here you can see HSCT looks good at first glance with a hazard ratio of 0.41. So 59% less disability progression. But wait a minute, look at this confidence interval, 0.09 to 1.9. That's ridiculous. That's a huge range. What does that mean? It simply means that people were relatively stable. They weren't really getting worse. There were relatively few getting worse because people with relapsing MS on Ocrevus tend to be stable, at least in the short run. And the authors did point out that the follow-up with Ocrevus was a little bit less than the other drugs, so it may have been difficult to demonstrate a difference. What about disability improvement? Here again, the trend favors HSCT with a hazard ratio of 2.3, so they were more than two times as likely to improve, but it was not statistically significant, a hazard ratio of 0.63 
to 8.48, a really large range, probably because not enough people were improving relative to Ocrevus. And if we look at some of the randomized trials for drugs like Ocrevus and Lemtrada, there are a significant number of people who do improve, not necessarily because of the drug itself. Of course, Ocrevus doesn't even enter the central nervous system. But when relapsing MS is stable, people have the opportunity to improve themselves. So really not a huge difference here. If you were to walk into a room with people who received HSCT and Ocrevus, it would be very difficult to tell who received what, at least based on this analysis. And next we move to Tysabri versus HSCT. In many ways, Tysabri is an appealing medication to me, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, just because I've had a lot of patients get bad COVID taking B cell depleters and other immunosuppressants. In a lot of ways, Tysabri is safer as an immunosequestrant, not an immunosuppressant, especially in people who are JC virus antibody negative. Of course, it does have its own issues with post-Tysabri rebound discussed in a prior video. So how does it fare against HSCT? Again, first we'll look at relapses. The Tysabri annualized relapse rate was 0.12, very low, only slightly higher than the HSCT annualized relapse rate of 0.09, really about the same and not statistically significantly different, and these are low numbers anyway. But what about progression? It's really the same story as with Ocrevus. EDSS worsening was less common with HSCT. In fact, it was half as likely a hazard ratio of 0.5. But again, look at this huge confidence interval of 0.09 to 2.61, which means that there just weren't very many people progressing on either medication because the overwhelming majority of people with relapsing MS on Tysabri are doing fairly well and are stable, at least in the short run. What about improvement? Again, HSCT looks good. This time it was statistically significantly better, even though the hazard ratio is a little bit lower. So you were 80% or 82% more likely to improve with HSCT as compared to Tysabri, and you can see the confidence interval of 1.19 to 2.78. So there was a benefit there, and there is a clear trend really against all three drugs in all three categories even though it wasn't always statistically significant, there was definitely a trend towards HSCT being better. But in terms of improvement and in terms of disability progression, the absolute numbers weren't huge. And of course, we'll see those absolute numbers in the full publication. I'm only inferring here, but I can tell from my experience with these types of confidence intervals. So if HSCT isn't necessarily that much better in preventing disability progression, Progression and causing disability improvement, is it worth the additional risk? Well, these are the side effects of HSCT reported in this study. Remember, there are various different conditioning regimens with different safety profiles. They reported a rate of febrile neutropenia. This is having fever and low neutrophils. The neutrophils are a type of white blood cells involved in fighting infections, and this can be quite dangerous. They reported a rate of 25%, but it's hard to know how many many of those people actually had serious infections. They reported an overall rate of post-discharge complications after people left the hospital of 36%. Again, it's hard to know how many of those were serious or long-lasting. And there was one person who died getting the transplant, which works out to 0.6%. Historically, HSCT was very dangerous with a mortality rate around 5%. In modern studies, the mortality rate is reported to be about 0.5% or less. In other words, 1 in 200. So this is roughly to be expected. And in prior studies, I don't know the cause of death here, most of those deaths are related to serious infections. Of course, there are other potential side effects of HSCT, such as infertility, not described here. Maybe we'll get some more details in the full publication. So what is the response to this study? Well, Dr. Bruce Cree, an MS researcher at the University of California, San Francisco, said in an interview 
quote, in my mind, the key question is, is autologous bone marrow transplantation superior to the very best therapy that we have today, Dr. Kree said. It is now time for the proponents of autologous bone marrow transplantation to stand up and organize and conduct a head-to-head -head clinical trial versus ocrelizumab, that's ocrevus, or perhaps a different anti-CD20 and demonstrate once and for all whether there clearly is superiority, whether there is advantage with respect to quality of life that justifies the procedure and the morbidity and mortality associated with the procedure. Well, Dr. Cree, you may just get your answer because there is in fact an ongoing randomized trial, the RAM-MS study comparing HSCT2, Limtrata, Mavenclad or Cladribine, and Ocrevus. So we'll follow this one up closely. But to give my own opinion, I think this study recapitulates what I already believe. I do think HSCT is better than drugs like Ocrevus, Gelenia, and Tysabri. And I think this study strongly suggests it because HSC did better in every outcome measure against every drug, even if the absolute difference was small and sometimes it wasn't statistically significant, the overall trend is quite clear. Now, of course, the side effect profile is concerning, even if death or very serious infections aren't that common. Keep in mind that the person who died may have had 30, 40 high quality life years in front of them if they had stuck with standard therapies. So you definitely have to consider the risks and benefits. And of course, again, I think that it's kind of silly to group all of these patients getting different conditioning regimens together because it's not all the same treatment. I'd love to know, do you think HSCT looks good in this study, or does it look not that much better than drugs like Ocrevus and Tysabri? Have you received HSCT? Which conditioning regimen did you get, and how did it work for you? And would you consider getting HSCT if you had the opportunity, or do you think the better side effect profile of drugs like Tysabri or Ocrevus is more attractive, and do you have suggestions for future videos?